What, what did you have, can I ask? Uh, I can only give you the symptoms. Okay. And that was is that um, the day after the retreat uh, was finished at uh, Deepa Bhawan, uh, four students came after the retreat over here. And it was that day that I began to notice symptoms. So I must have picked something up from either one or all of them. And the two symptoms at that time was coughing uh, and, and sneezing and uh, going in the direction of congestion. But then the next day there was no congestion, nor was there a fever, but there was deep lethargy, just <laughs> very, very low, low energy. And another thing that was associated with is that everything seemed to be cloudy, that the mind just would not function. Mm -hmm. uh, examples of that would be to remember to do something and then to forget it immediately. This has not happened in so many years. But for instance, you, you, you clean things out to go to a web page to get something that you're looking for. And by the time you get there, you've forgotten what you were going to look for. Yeah, great stuff. That kind of stuff just does not happen to a good meditator. So that shows you that <laughs> the, mind, the brain was just not working. <laughs> Oh, man. Just things would just blah, just just yeah. drop right out of the mind. Yeah. Interesting that a sickness can or a illness can still just do that. That we're so dependent on our body. Well, the the mind can't do without a brain. Mm. I know a lot of people believe that they can do without a brain, but <laughs> no, brains are absolutely necessary. <laughs> So yeah, um, I practice your, uh, <laughs> every time I remember the breath feeling uh, really good, I remember something like remembering the moment that you realize you're going to get laid, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's yes, really good. That that's that's very good other people will have the same kind of aha uh, or memory in the sense of like getting a lot of money or winning um, a lottery or something like that so christian is calling now i'm going to uh add him in hello hey hello Hi. christian me? We know each other. Yeah. Meet, meet my friend Christian. <laughs> we were together on the Tucker retreat a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, nice to see you. How are you doing? Yeah, good, good. How are you doing? Oh, so that must have been the connection. Okay, there was confusion about that. Because when I was talking to Tucker, I said, it's either two or three. <laughs> and it turns out that it was a three, but two of them were Christian. That's <laughs> uh, funny. Yeah. So, you guys already know each other then? Yeah, we talked a little bit there, yeah. Yeah, not that much, but yeah. As good as you know each other when you're on retreat. Mm. Silent retreat. Yeah. Well, the one who's known the best is the one who makes the most noise. <laughs> That's true at retreats and everywhere else, including politics. <laughs> yeah. So that was Tucker, definitely. <laughs> um, Nick and I were just talking about his his lack of sense of community mm -hmm. that now he has gotten into the Dhamma that 
uh, he just doesn't seem to fit into any place anymore. And so I told him about, we didn't record that, so I'll just repeat some of the stuff that we were talking about there, is that that's, we see that in many places. Two examples would be when a guy gets married, he stops associating with the friends that he was running around with before he were married. The very guys that go to his wedding and celebrate him and all of that, those are the guys he never sees again. <laughs> On oh, another one is um, at AA that when alcoholics join Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the things that they realize is, is that they can't hang around with their old drunk friends anymore. If they're going to quit drinking, they got to quit associating with those who do. And that, that happens also naturally in almost anything. Uh, an example then would be that when somebody starts going to the gym, he stops going to a particular restaurant, stops going to the gym. What that means is, is now he's going to change his whole friendship set from the guys he used to hang out with uh, who were sitting at the restaurant eating, and now he's joining the uh, pump them up crowd. And so he changes his set of friends. This is then, with that kind of logic, that's bound to happen to meditators. The thing that's really strange in, in these groups and things like that, and I find it really true with meditators, is, is that we tend to get really opinionated and compete with each other. And everybody's got their own attitude about things. And I think part of that reason is, is that we're only talking about things that are really, really important. When you start hanging out with guys at the gym, then we talk about things that are about the gym. And we can agree on that kind of stuff because it's got some physical reality to it. And he can say, look at this. And you look at that. And he says, pump this. And you pump that and say, wow. And all of that kind of stuff. And it's all very real. Same thing with alcohol getting away from alcoholics so that you can stop drinking is absolutely mandatory. There's no other way about it. However, within the Dhamma world, unfortunately, we're dealing with really, really important stuff. I mean, the very depths of what people are actually on about, the kind of things that are almost antisocial and off topic. Talk about religion and politics being not allowed. Oh, no, it's who I am is what's not allowed. Hmm. And yet that's what we're investigating and doing deeply in the Dhamma. So it's quite naturally then for defenses to come up because we're dealing with really, really deep fears like the fear of death, fear of not knowing of who I am, not figuring things out and that kind of stuff. And that gets then into a kind of situation where many times, especially when they're <clears throat> not in the Dhamma for very long. And when I say not in the Dhamma for very long, I'm talking about say under 10, maybe 20 years. Anything under 10 years is diapers. <laughs> I wore Dhamma diapers for 10 years until I finally figured a few things out. But the point is, is then after 20 years, the Buddha, in fact, told Ananda on one occasion that, oh, no, friendship is not half of the Dhamma path. Friendship is the whole Dhamma path. Is to learning how to be friends with everything including all of our fears and all of our competitors on Reddit or wherever, and just be friends with everybody. That's the whole of the path. And that that's what the word Kaliametta or spiritual friends idea is all about is to, is to change your friendships with, with uh, people in the, in the ordinary world, will not quite bring up as much competition as it does within us, each one of us, when we're dealing in Dhamma. Because within the Dhamma, we know it, that we're dealing with the really deepest stuff there is. And so our hardcore beliefs, we defend 
in a hardcore kind of way. And this causes arguments that people wind up not realizing that they could get a whole lot more out of the Dhamma by listening to each other and then putting together is almost everything that anybody has to say is just yet another piece of this jigsaw puzzle. And I didn't have that piece before and didn't know what color it was or anything. So now that this guy is giving it to me, let's inspect it. Let's investigate this thing. Let's see how it fits in to the puzzle. And so we can then begin to get a complete idea of things and always working in the sense of friendship. However, that may not always be the case. And you can see that in the sense of what's happening on some of the, uh, uh, the, the internet. That even though on ordinary places like Facebook and Instagram and uh, many of the other sites that I don't have a clue about <laughs> the names of, you'll find people doing an awful lot of arguing lot of arguing, having a, a whole new language about trolls and trolling and things like that. Um, and so that's naturally also going to be within the, uh, the world of Dhamma. And so if we are going to find some way of, of actually building a Dhamma community, it's got to be done on friendship and cooperation, as opposed to competition, I know the Dhamma better than you do, kind of situation. And so Danny has started a new Reddit, uh, subreddit, uh, by the name of Supra Mundane Dhamma. And, and so I would like it if you guys could join, and if you do, put in a little bio about yourself. Yeah, that's really awesome. if my keyboard would work <laughs> later. Okay. Yeah, you can remember that. So we, we're going to open a new one. And at first, Danny wanted to keep it uh, uh, closed in the sense of anybody can read, but only people who request permission to post would get permission to post. And I said, no, let's take that off and leave it kind of open. So I think in the next day or two, Danny will see that message and we'll open it up. But for right now, it's, it's closed and you got to ask him permission to join. But after that, it'll be open at least for a while. Okay. And so, pardon? Will you also join? Yes. Okay. Yes, that one I will join. How come actually that you're uh, not joining the discussion on Reddit yourself? Was that There's a lot of reasons for that. A lot, and all of the reasons have to do with nobility. That it would not be appropriate. That, uh, hmm, how to say it? There's a certain quality of speech that when it does not have a lot of self in it, it, it sounds kind of an authoritarian, like this is it, and that's that, and this is us, and whatnot like that. And that often gets people uh, competitive. <laughs> and in that regard, it's, uh, it's a style uh, that uh, is is naturally developed that could actually be called a lion's roar to where the right way in normal speech is to be evasive at least in language while underneath all of that competition of you're right and I'm right or you're wrong and all of this but they, they couch it in terms like in my humble opinion or it's it's uh, it, how to say it? <laughs> we 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 tend to mask our conceit in wishy-washy language. Does that make any sense to you? And and so just flat direct talk 
about the Dhamma uh, uh, elicits a lot of, oh, no, it's not. Oh, well, somebody else said it was like this and all of that kind of stuff. So that's the reason that I don't post. It's not appropriate for one who is in the position of being a teacher to be in an argumentative place with a bunch of people who consider themselves students. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. It would be like an example of a university setting where a group of students are in the dining hall and one of the professors, uh, one of their professors, comes in and sits down at the table with them. In that setting, he has actually reduced himself now to be just one of the people at the table. But if he comes in and stands, then he's going to get attention. So it has a lot to do with body language. And that kind of body language is also evident in reddits and groups like that. So if the college professor wants to maintain being the college professor and not just one of the crowd, and a lot of professors do actually want to be one of the crowd. They want to fit in. They have that longing, that need that never been filled, you know, and so they want to fit in and whatnot like that. But a, a real lion of a professor is not going to sit down with students. Hmm going to stay aloof. He's going to stay away. If they want him as a professor, they can come to him as a professor. But he's not going to sit down and be one of the guys at the table. Unless he wants to abandon his station. I could imagine sometimes like out of the role as professor, just as a human, I guess, that he would connect with people to meet like that. If, that's, if, they, if he has need to do that, but you can see that in so many different places. For instance, in the military, officers do not dine with the troops. Hmm. They have their own separate dining hall and the generals do not eat even with the, uh, the, uh, the lieutenants and captains. They too are separated. All right. Another example would be in any big corporation, the higher in management you go, the more um, aloof or separated their offices are. In other words, the president is not going to have his office without a, with not even a cubicle, just his desk is sitting right out there on the factory floor, not a chance. If he has his desk right out there on the factory floor so he's accessible and can see what's going on, he will lose control. At best, what he needs to do is move his desk upstairs with a big window so that he can still look out and see what's going on on the factory floor and may even have a better view of it, but he's still separated from all of the factory workers. So you can see that in the real world. It's, it's all a matter of body language. The, sci the uh, psychologists have done so much research, there are tons of books on this. So it's, uh, 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 and you can see that that's true on other teachers. Do you know of any well-known teacher of Dhamma who is actually out there regularly or even occasionally posting on Reddit. Yeah, Tucker does so. Hey. Tucker? Tucker Peck, he, yeah. he has some postings. How, how often does he do that? Well, not that often. It's more like he has his view of what is stream entry, entry like or what is subtle dullness like. So it's not that uh, argumentative. It's just Here's my view, and I'm gone, basically. <laughs> That's that. That, if anything, is the correct way to do it. That's precisely the right way. Is to come in, lay it out, and walk out. You do not get into arguments or discussions. 
so you know one. And he's still new to it. <laughs> His occasion may be that he might not ever post again. Who knows? But all of the others, like Tula Dasa and Dan Ingram and Jacques Cornfield and none of those guys very often, they stay away from it. They do not get into... Well, Tula Dasa was on the Yahoo group for a long time. On what? On, on the Yahoo group. That's why he wrote this book. He, he was in the Yahoo group giving people advice and then uh, he wrote the book out of that. Oh, okay. So... You're saying there he was using that as a place for teaching? I think so. I, I, I don't know the content of the group. Wow. Uh, or even if it was a madhouse when he came in, he organized it. He took the time to do that and, and took it over. That's interesting. Mm. Daniel Ingram founded his own forums, right? Where he yes. Posted regularly or still does, I think. Right. That's what I'm getting at is we've got our own now. Hmm. Okay. So that we can stay, let us say, within the worm, the world of the Kubuta Dasa without having a lot of uh, controversy because people have learned things from other traditions, whether it's Vajrayana or Mahasi or whatever like that. The people can ask questions like how it fits in because it's quite interesting. That I don't see much difference between the Mahasi method and the Goenka method and Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa's method. There's not much difference. The point is, is that it has to do with which direction that you're looking at it. But now, The issue, I think, though, is is that neither the um, Goenka nor the uh, Mahasi method is explained correctly and deeply enough so that students get the point. Yeah, I didn't get the Goenka method at the retreats. <laughs> well, most students don't get the Goenka method, and part of the reason is is that he doesn't teach enough of it of Anapanasati. Mm. He just, in fact, he just uses the word anapana, and I don't understand why he doesn't use the word sati, because he uses the word mindfulness all the time, which is normally the translation of the word sati. Hmm. But if you look at it like this, he only teaches three days of uh, breathing without talking about much distinction between the long and the, and the short breath. And then he jumps into six or seven days of Uh, body scanning, which would then be step three of Anapanasati. To where with the Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa's uh, understanding is, is that even though the Anapanasati Sutta was laid out that way, and even though the normal old style practices to practice it in the order of the way that it's laid out, that really the mind is not like that and that things have to be done in a, let us say, in the order of occurrence rather than the order of the manual, mm -hmm. which is then the distinction between an organized method and a natural method. And with the natural method, we're, we actually incorporate the Eightfold Noble Path right into the practice of Anapanasati. That in fact, you cannot do Anapanasati or in fact, any meditation, regardless of what it's called, without at least some of the path of the Eightfold Path. The right attitude that you're going to practice, whatever it is you decided to practice, that's <laughs> right attitude already. And uh, a right, excuse me, right view already that is better to practice. So in whatever practice the person is doing, that's... Uh, right, right view has got to be there. The second thing is, is that if something to be practiced over and over again, like to remember to come back to the breath, then sati is involved. So whatever it is, in fact, uh, uh, Zen and the art of archery, they use a lot of breathing, but their sati is all about how to keep possibly going exactly the right movements 
This is all, and Tai Chi is like that. Many martial arts, in fact, have adapted that. The whole idea of sati is to be here now, to watch what's going on, etc. So that's in most methods, too. The Eightfold Noble Path is just natural like that. The next part is right effort, because most systems, the students always practice wrongly in the beginning by either not putting enough effort in or putting too much effort in. But getting that exact perfect balance of just the right amount of effort, that takes the skill to be developed. And that's true regardless of what you're learning to do. To stop struggling with it, relax. Okay, and so these skills that are to be developed in any technique require parts of the Eightfold Noble Path. But if there's any one of them missing, it's the right attitude that comes out of being a, uh, a loser, or let us say someone who hopes to get some advantage out of doing these practices, but he still keeps the same attitude. Then he's not practicing right attitude, which is also possibly in, in this case is the most obvious aspect of the Eightfold Noble Path is one who has right attitude. And that right attitude then is the attitude that comes out of being a victim. That's why we practice meditation. Why would you ever practice meditation if you didn't think you needed it? All right? Hmm. So everybody who comes to meditation comes with already the attitude of a victim. And if we keep that, sorry about that. <laughs> and so that attitude of the victim can either be, be consistently changed from wrong attitude of loser into right attitude of being winner or even a higher attitude of being noble. And when you have that, then you truly have noble right view. But coming out of wrong view of victim into right view of being a winner is the first step out. Yeah, and the Buddha notice. was a lion. The Buddha was a lion. He was not a lamb. He roared. And noticed when I started implementing that more in the past weeks, maybe, yeah, especially the last weeks, trying to uh, feel this. I remembered this attitude of a lion every time I came back uh, and kind of ran into myself that brought up some opposite feelings to that. And it was like sometimes a struggle to actually uh, have that new attitude come out as a winner in between those two. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for seeing that. That's really good. You're beginning to see. Yes, there is resistance to that being a lion. Who is that resisting? It's the loser. It's the victim the one who is comfortable in being a victim, the one who really does want some help from the outside so he doesn't have to do it himself. That's the whole basis of Christianity and other religions. If you take Jesus as your savior, you don't have to do squat. <laughs> He'll do it all for you. Oh, but it's going to cost you 10%. <laughs> um, how do you re relate it to the four noble truths? Because you, you mentioned to me that the third noble truth is very important. Is that your interpretation of the third noble truth? Uh, well, let us say both. Yes, but also support. The support is from Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa. And he talks about it in, in a lot of different books that he's written. One is by the name of hunger and happiness, and another one he talks about it as Nibbana for everyone. But in private conversations, he, we discuss it directly as the third noble truth. The third noble truth is to be in that state of being that you enjoy being in, which is free from suffering. We all long for that. So when it comes, 
recognize that too. In fact, invite it. It's a skill to be developed. Just like being a victim was a skill that we developed. Some kids are really skilled at being a victim. Mm. In fact, if they get skilled at being a victim enough, they'll wind up getting locked up in a mental hospital for the rest of their lives, being well taken care of, and they're fine. <laughs> Please help me tie my shoes. I can't do it. Now, that can actually be also in the sense of old age. Because many old people will become a victim of their old age and they need more and more assistance. But with the right attitude, it can be a toy. Oh, I don't have to do that. I'm just too old. <laughs> Boy, life gets really easy when you get old because you got a perfect excuse. When you're 30 and you say, oh, I'm just not up to that, <laughs> nobody will believe you. <laughs> but 73, okay, okay, we'll let you by. And so old age could be an advantage if you know how to play it. But most people, they don't because they're already in the habit of being a victim their whole lives. And so now old age is just, they're victimized by that too. And so we have this attitude of being a victim, but with the attitude change based upon right view plus right effort that in Anapanasati is pointed out in the sense of gladdening the mind and uh, that rapture or uh, becoming very successful. Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa also talks about success in that regard. The feelings of success bring happiness. And so we, we, we need to capitalize on that and work on it and build up almost to the point that we see that um, being able to do things that generate success is a skill to be developed. So that you can feel successful every time you remember to take a deep breath. Now, how successful can you be? You can be successful all day. Look at very rich people who feel successful only when they can steal a whole lot of money, how many months it gets set up with all the ups and downs of, well, won't we, will we get caught? Will we get away with it? Blah, blah, blah. And then he finally pulls the deal off and now he gets one high, which fades because he doesn't know how to maintain it. And everybody is out there looking for that high. Some guys have that high when they finally figure out they're going to get laid tonight. <laughs> but through Anapanasati, we recognize, oh no, that's a skill to be developed. That, that full on success, and it's right there in the suttas, and in any of the books that Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa has written on Anapanasati, that if you dig deeply through the English language down to really what he's getting at, you'll see, yeah, that's what he's talking about. That's what rapture really is, or pity is really all about, is that deep abiding satisfaction that we get from being successful. Hmm. That's the reason people play slot machines or go to casinos, is for that feeling of I win. Not the thrill of, do I win, seconds before that, but I do win. I win. I get it. So and this is... has to be practiced because that is what helps develop that right attitude of being a winner, being successful, is a, is a skill to be developed, and it is developed through Zanapanasati. So in that regard, the Eightfold Noble Path and Anapanasati run in circle around each other. They're the, they're the same teaching. Mm -hmm. And then when you recognize, oh, further, we can also see then that to do Anapanasati correctly, especially by the time you get to step uh, seven of experiencing the uh, mental formations, that's exactly the practice that we, that we refer to in 
uh, theoretical or descriptive terms is Anapanasati. But once we understand the process, uh, excuse me, of Paticca Samapada, and once we understand the process of Paticca Samapada, we'll know exactly when and where to hone in on to start watching that stuff that comes in one of two ways. It'll either come in the th in form of thoughts or it'll come in the form of feelings. Now, one of the ways of looking at it, once we get into that really blissful, not, well, okay, blissful, we'll call it, state of, of sukha, once we get into that first jhana, that is a, from when we have the ability to be free from the hindrances, we get that great big gush of, ah, I'm free now, so that we're secluded. From those hindrances, we have that rapture that melts into joy or sukha. We want to then maintain that state. And so we begin to get on guard for what's in the mind. Well, what's in the mind, one of the things that's in the mind are thoughts, random thoughts that, in fact, we call hindrances are just thoughts. And so we say, okay, well, we're going to start guarding for what thoughts we allow in the mind. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to decide those kind of thoughts that have to do with hindrances, we're not going to allow in the mind to now. We're not just not going to let them in because we know if we do let them in, they'll eventually take us out of this catbird seat or this sukha that we have. This satisfaction will be lost if we allow thoughts of the past, the future, thoughts of doubt, thoughts of desire, thoughts of not liking things, etc. Any of those kind of thoughts that come in are now we're on guard to make sure those thoughts don't get in. Well, what thoughts are we going to allow in? Because we are still thinking. We're not in second jhana yet. We're just in first jhana. And in first jhana, we want to start applying the mind and sustaining the mind on wholesome thoughts. What's worth wholesome? Well, one of the things that's really wholesome to be uh, uh, mindful of or to be watching or to be thinking about is what's happening right now. This is basically the Mahasi message is talk to yourself or think about what's happening right now. Rising, falling, itching, touching, etc. like that. And so keep the mind focused on what's happening right now. But that's also a way to keep the mind really focused. But we can think, even if we're noting, sometimes the th thinking will be there. So we want to be able to find a way of getting all of the thinking under control in the sense of applying it to the all of the Four Noble Truths. Most specifically, this is in the Sutta now, to understand when suffering is there, that this is suffering, to be on guard for suffering, to know what suffering is. For instance, letting uh, thoughts of the past come into mind, that's suffering. We're going to keep that out. We're going to be applying the mind for the Four Noble Truths. The second one <clears throat> is in the sense of uh, being on guard for what feelings are there, or being on guard for what is right thoughts would be the second noble truth in the sense of now I am not going to be ignorant of those feelings of liking and not liking coming up. Because if liking and unliking come up ignorantly, just like the second noble truth says, then that will lead to tanha, thirst. I like it, I want it, I want it, I got to have it, and I got to have it is the I that's got to have it. The ownership comes in with an owner. It's, high, it's really hard to have any ownership without an owner. Is that not true? I mean, even in law, <laughs> you got to have an owner or there's no ownership. And so that's what we've become as an owner. What we need to learn to do is be an agent instead to where we don't own this stuff, but we can still operate it. We can, we can work with these feelings, can see them. So in that regard, we're doing the second noble truth, but at the same time, we're also working with Paticca Samapada, and at all the same time, we're actually doing step eight, seven, uh, Anapanasati. 
So you see, we're just looking at the same thing over and over and over again. But now let's get to the depth of your question, and that is the investigation of, or uh, what is it like um, uh, to be attending to the third noble truth? Of uh, this is the end of suffering, and that we can see that and contemplate it too. Right now, I am in a first jhana. I'm in a state of sukha. I am not allowing any thoughts or any feelings to disturb that space. This is it. This is really nice. This is kind of like what Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa calls a little nibbana moment. And it is really closely based with the happiness that comes from the success that we got by practicing uh, uh, pity or the, the feeling of success. Now, here's another point, and that is, is that there is the word uh, and the concept that goes with it called idiopada. The word idia in Sanskrit means city, and it's normally referred to as magical language. In, excuse me, it's referred to in magical language as magical powers. Examples are diving into the earth and swimming in the earth, walking on the water, uh, clear audience, clairvoyance, uh, walking through walls, the kind of, you know, the kind of stuff that you would go to a circus to see. Not to a meditation teacher. <laughs> we go to a circus nowadays to look for magic. Or sometimes Las Vegas, because they've got a lot of magic going on in Las Vegas. I hear there's a Buddhist temple there, too. I wonder what they do at that temple. I'll tell you what they do at that temple. There's a lot of Asians, especially from California, who go to Las Vegas to gamble. Asians are really big into gambling, so they go to this water, too, to do pooches and all kinds of things to get good luck at the gambling tables. And so this, this what that I'm talking about that I know of specifically is just filthy rich. <laughs> and therefore, it's one of the prize or plum items for monks who are looking for a good watch that's going to make a lot of money for them. They want to go to that one in Las Vegas because they know that's a real money maker for the monks because so many people are looking for magic. So yeah, there's a lot of, ma a lot of Asians looking for magic at, um, at Las Vegas. But practicing Anapanasati, we recognize, oh, that really, really good feeling that those Asians are looking for can be manufactured and generated within our own mind. And by doing that, that puts us in a state of being a really, really kind of <laughs> top quality winner that we've got actually the teaching of the Buddha is the very very best teaching there is because it will take you to the highest station that you can achieve the very height of humanity the very top quality humanity is what he referred to as noble Aryan and so when one is noble with noble mind, you automatically keep the precepts. Precepts are actually given to people who are not noble, who are not on the path, who are wanting to be on the path, perhaps meditators. They're the ones who get precepts. Nobles don't need precepts. One who has a noble mind is automatically not going to be taking things that's not given because he doesn't want anything. <laughs> He's not going to kill anyone because he's got no reason to kill anybody. And it's a lot of work. Have you ever thought about it? I mean, what does it take to actually kill somebody? <laughs> That's far too much work. I'm way too lazy to even care, even if I hated them, but I don't have anybody that I hate, so there's nobody I want to kill. So <laughs> no longer a precept. It's just that part of the noble mind. Who cares about doing that kind of stuff? But flies are easy to kill. Pardon? Uh, flies or small animals, they're easy to kill. Well, I tell you what, people who are on that level of, oh no, that's common and that's killing, they're kind of the absolutists. They're the ones who want to make the Buddha's teachings literal, 
when in fact it's almost all metaphorical. Hmm. That in fact, someplace in the Dhamma, I don't know where I should go look it up, but this kind of detail would be hard to find, needle in a haystack. But you do know that the that the uh, the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu in China, well, he, that was written at about the time of the Buddha. And the opening line is, is that the Tao that can be said is not the Tao. Do you know that phrase? No. You ever heard it? Wow, I'm surprised. I thought everybody knew about that. The Tao that can be said is not the Tao. It's almost the same thing as saying that the Dhamma that can be said, not the Dhamma, because it's actually talking about the same thing. What we mean here is, is that things have to present, be presented in with examples and metaphors, because we're talking about stuff that's so deep that it goes quite beyond language. What English language word do we have for the poly word pity? I don't know of one. I know of a, a sound to make that expresses it, but it's an emotional sound. It's not a word. And what is that word? Well, what is the word that somebody's going to say when they get a really, really big win? They take a really fast, deep in breath, and then they let it out. <laughs> That's the only English language word I have for pity. Hmm. And that's the skill that you want to develop. That flat out, oh, wow, this is so good. <laughs> you know, ah, is the sound that goes along with the feeling of joy of full success. And this then is that state that the mind gets in, settles into the state of happiness, the state of sukha, that then can be considered the third jhana, excuse me, the third noble truth. This is first jhana, not, not third. And the Buddha actually in another sutta, 36, talks about the fact that the first jhana is the path to enlightenment, not the higher jhanas. It's this first jhana where we can live our lives in great joy and be on guard <clears throat> to not allow any bad feelings or bad thoughts to come. And we can just hang out in a wonderful state. Hmm. And you can live your life in, in the state of joy, practicing the, the Four Noble Truths but now they become what would be called second nature or another way of talking about it. We get used to just living that way of considering everything through the lens of the Four Noble Truths. Is this suffering or not? What am I doing to cause suffering? What can I do to stop causing suffering? The answer to that is stop being ignorant. Well, what does that mean? It means look at what you're doing. Well, what does that mean? It means sati, 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 sati. That's what it means. <laughs> yeah, I thought that equanimity was seen as sort of superior to to joy or to feeling of happiness in, in uh, Buddhism. What if it is or not? Are you going to go from misery to equanimity directly? Uh, I guess not. But, uh, no, that's that's why pity is on the eighth uh, is uh, uh, the the I think it's the fourth item on the seven factors of enlightenment. Hmm. When pity and sukha, when the pleasure is there, one hundred not one hundred percent of the time, but through one hundred percent dedication to stay on that. In other words, unremitting. So the seven factors of enlightenment are unremitting sati, to keep remembering, to keep remembering, to keep remembering. What's the second? The second factor of enlightenment is continuousing investigation, investigation, investigation. Keep looking, keep being on guard, keep watching. The third one then is right energy. 
unremitting energy is actually nothing but one's right effort. But when, when the right effort becomes noble right effort, it's actually just an energy. It just, well, there it is. The fourth one then is unremitting rapture, unremitting pity, unremitting joy. That one also has to be done too, so that you really get the self up, we really get that lion's roar going. After that will come unremitting equanimity. And in fact, you could think of it like this, is that the equanimity is the same thing as the sukha that I was just talking about, that comes after the, the pity, the high, the I gotcha the ding, 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 ding of the slot machine or <laughs> whatever way that I can express it to you through metaphor so that you get the idea of what we're talking about. Because I can't tell you directly. I can only tell you through metaphor. So and so say. that equanimity is the state that you want to stay in, but it's a state of great pleasure. It is not a zero. It's a balanced state that you want to maintain because you like it so much. Not an equanimity that's dead meat. But that's how most Westerners think of equanimity. I don't even think that it's a good word to use. I think balance would be a better word. Another one would be unification of mind because, in fact, that's the next one after that one is... Uh, uh, unremitting samadhi, which means that the mind now is completely um, united. This is a unification of the mind. Now, let me give you some examples of what makes the mind not unified so that you can get an idea of what I mean when the mind is unified, okay? Because <laughs> I can't tell you directly what it means other than to talk about it as the high point the pinnacle. The, uh, in one of the suttas, they use the example of a yurt, to where you have the center ridge pole, and then you have all of the other ridge poles around, but they all meet at the top. Another example would be an American teepee. This is what we mean by samati, and unremitting means you keep coming back to that state of wholeness, that state of unity, that state of collectedness. And so let's look at a, a lot of stuff where people are not in that position. One is that if they have any doubt, doubt about who I am, doubt about practice, doubt about uh, uh, rebirth, doubt about um, will I die or not, doubt about is Anapanasati the right practice for me, doubt about which brand of toothpaste to use, you know, ordinary things that people have a lot of doubt about. They're unsure, they're uncertain, they have um, um, no clearness. And, in, and along with that, in that regard, that also means that um, there is an underlying fear that gives rise to that kind of doubt. In other words, the doubts in this case are all about thoughts, and I just gave you a long string of examples or metaphors of the kinds of thoughts. But actually, this doubt that arises is springing from a feeling of uneasiness. Something's wrong. We need to find out what it is. Okay, another example when the mind would not be unified would be in the case of lying, telling a lie. We're separating ourselves from this truth. In fact, we're dividing ourselves in half, the noble part and the lie. And you can see then that um, one of the things, one of the qualities that we want to have uh, in this noble first jhana is the ability to see how things are and stop lying to ourselves. Stop trying to make up stories. Stop wanting it to be different than the way that it is and accept joyously the way things actually are, and we can see them clearly, including all of the junk that we've been hiding from. And when I say junk, I'm talking about bad feelings, feelings of fear, feelings of anguish, feelings of um, anxiety, 
uh, feelings of, of the fears that are associated with uh, being called out or challenged. That we don't like it. We don't like the feeling of being challenged. So we want to fight back. These are the kinds of things then that keep us from being unified with a mind that's noble, that's above all of that. Another example would be conflict of interest. And we all have conflicts of interest. Do I go? Do I stay? Am I here? Am I there? Do I join this group of meditators or do I join that group of meditators? You know, that kind of thing. We become um, conflicted actually within our own um, minds in the sense of uh, entertaining two thoughts that don't fit together. An example of that would be a scientist who believes in creationism. Even he's, you know, that should, it doesn't match. And yet somehow or another, all week long, he can be a really good scientist. And then on the weekend, he's a really good creationist Christian. And he doesn't realize that he's drawn a line inside of his brain somewhere that just cuts him in half. And he lives two different lives. He's not whole. He's not unified. <clears throat> Would, would you say that the whole noble path is a sort of integration of like you you try to unify your mind around non-suffering? Yes, exactly so. Exactly so. And in fact, that's what makes the, the Pali word samadhi different than the word concentration. The word concentration in English normally has the quality of removing unimportant qualities and getting down to just the good stuff. An example would be concentrated orange juice, concentrated milk, those kinds of things that we put in concentrated form in the sense of taking all of the stuff out that we don't need and getting the very best part of it. Another way of thinking about concentration is by putting something under pressure to make it smaller. But this is not the, the quality that we're looking for with samadhi. Samadhi does not mean either one of those kinds of concentrations. The way that Westerners kind of think of the word concentration, and that's the word that we hear, that's the English language word that we have because um, there is, as far as I know, no real word for samadhi. But I do know that concentration is not it. <laughs> so they try to concentrate your mind by removing all of the outside stuff so that they can focus down on things. Well, let's look at the Zendo where the Zen master with his Zen stick is walking around the Zendo. Who does he hit? Who gets hit with the Zen stick on the shoulder? Huh? The one who's slouching, who's falling down. Well, let us say he who does not know that the meditation teacher just snuck up on him. Notice my posture just now. The meditation master just came up behind me. Did you see what I did? I alerted him that I know that he's here. And so I don't get hit. The guy who makes no movements at all is not aware that the Zen master is there. And he's the one that gets whacked. So, in fact, if this guy is so deep into meditation that he's not watching for the fact that, this, that he's not here now with the Zen master, he's the one that's going to get hit for being in jhana. Because he's not watching what's going on. He's not paying attention. He's too frigging concentrated. Huh? He's not paying attention to what's going on. And I tell you what, in martial arts, if you're not paying attention to what's going on, you're going to get a bloody nose in a second. Not even a second. <laughs> Not watching what's going on. 
So this is the whole quality of the state that the Buddha is recommending us to get into is this first jhana, not too concentrated, but unified so that there's a wholeness there. And that we're on guard, we're on alert. We're not going to allow things that are unwholesome into the mind. We're going to be aware also if the Zen master steps up behind. We're going to feel that in the body, even though he doesn't make a sound, the body knows he's there. And if we're paying attention to our body, we'll know the Zen master is behind us. In that regard, uh, noble, those of noble mind can easily sneak up on someone who is an ordinary person, low class, ordinary minded person. Um, does, does that mean that if I fall into second jhana, I have to go back to first jhana? No, you can enjoy second jhana if you like it. But likely what will happen is thoughts will start up. And if they do, then you're no longer in second jhana. And if they do start up, what thoughts are starting up? If they're unwholesome hindrances, then they're going to pull you out of jhana altogether. Can you still investigate in jhanas two to four? Not very much. Okay. Because whatever comes up is likely to just to throw you right out of it. In first jhana, you can be watchful, mindful, aware of it, and keep it out. Mind's a very fickle thing like that, and so getting it to stop, getting the thinking part to stop, then in that second jhana allows the second jhana dude to then build on the rapture and pity that he started to do in the first jhana so that it begins to whelm up this is where the bodily sensation stuff start to come in is in that second jhana to where we feel almost overwhelmed with bodily sensations some of it's coming out of the deep part of the mind others is just this is it when we're really fully there with the body it's really electric it's really alive and the analogy that's used or the metaphor that's used is an artesian well that's been made into a pond do you know what i mean by an artesian well no, some know. some water wells and this happens especially in the springtime when the snow is melting, the water not just bubbles out of the ground, but sometimes just rushes out. It just gushes right out of the ground. This is normally done uh, in mountains where you have an, an interior place so that the water collects here and then it just kind of pops out all by itself. These areas then are fairly easy for humans to come with machinery or just baskets of dirt and build a dam around it and make it into a pond. They even did this in the time of the Buddha. So now you have the situation that you've got a pond that's full of water that has come from the artesian well bubbling up, but when it comes to being part of the pond, it's heated by the surface, on the surface by the sun. So it's a regular pond when you just get into it. But if you get right to that certain spot where that artesian well is, you become overwhelmed with the feeling of all of that bubbling water coming up. There's a different temperature than the water around you. And so the strangeness of the different temperatures of the water and all of the movement and circulation and everything is really overwhelming. I happen to have been in a place where we did have such a pond at least once in my lifetime. So I have had actually the experience that the Buddha is talking about in the suttas. So there must have been a pond around them someplace that the Buddha knew exactly about that people could go and experience this. That's why I used it as the analogy. But that's then what we kind of experience in second jhana is when the mind has no words when the thinking part of the mind is literally kind of shut down, you could almost think uh, in, in this regard that the, uh, uh, the, the verbal sankara is very much like the middle section of the brain 
that has to do with language that some people call the mammalian brain. It's the kind of brain that monkeys have because monkeys are actually very good at communications. They're not very good at human thought in that regard, but they at least have a kind of thinking system going. And there's a language that's there. And so in that part of the brain is when we bring that to rest, that's the second jhana, but then we're left with all of these overwhelming sensations and feelings and whatnot that erupt out of the sankaras of the mind that literally overwhelm the body. I have seen monks actually look as if they're jumping up where in fact they're not. They're just the, the knees, some one knee will just go down and bang and it just kind of throws him over. So there's all kinds of movements. These things are actually quite spelled out in the Basuti Maga. I think there's like five or seven different ones. And the first one would be at the level of where the hairs on the arm will stand on end or the hair on the back of your neck. Another one would be shivers, like shivers of cold that come in cold, that come up and down the body. Another one would, would be eventually it gets so much that the whole body just <laughs> And once these things start to are developed, just by talking about them, they start reoccurring. So that if I can't tell you about it without actually bringing that stuff on. <laughs> but to begin with, it's in the second jhana to where the you can imagine then that you are in that pond in this place of where on top or above that artesian well that the body in a way begins to lose its complete control because the water itself is moving the body in this not a, not a vortex or a whirl but just in an uprush so this is the uh the, the uh explanation of of the second jhana and so the qualities of the second jhana is this own rush of really masterfully good feelings I'm trying while to, the mind is very very quiet i'm trying to bring this together right now with uh, what tula dasa writes in his book because i think he says this pt would be coming before you enter first jhana actually and the full arising of that you would be the joy then it has to it has to be if it's a jhana factor now doesn't it yeah but he it doesn't arise if it's a jhana factor it doesn't arise after you're in first jhana because then it wouldn't be a jhana factor it'd be result of first jhana but if it's an actual jhana factor that means you have together the, the jhana factors together so that you have first jhana so he's absolutely right okay i just thought you said that was second jhana no these well uh... no ra no the first jhana has rapture and pity as jhana factors it's only in the second jhana where it becomes overwhelming in the first jhana you really really like it in the second jhana it grabs you by the whole body <laughs> so does it mean there's no ecstasy like eruption because i sometimes feel that, like that is the ecstasy that's it but sometimes i feel like it erupts i cannot control it and then it's over but that is second jhana well if you can't control it then it's not fruit of second jhana it's only the beginning of the path of second jhana okay the fruit of second jhana is to sit there and <laughs> let it happen let it rip <laughs> but, but in first jhana i don't need that eruption i call it uh, actually that should be the quality that you're intending to um, manufacture. That's the skill to develop that eruption. That's that's that. I try to give that with the metaphor of I don't have a word for poly for the poly word pity, but I can give you a sound. That's the sound of the eruption that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
but you're talking about it as an eruption without a sound, but the whole point is, yes, you just let it flow, let it out. Develop that. Know that you can, in fact, become skillful at it. But, but I wonder, because you said I should maintain uh, the first jhana after, or th that's the whole point, to maintain the first jhana. But I cannot maintain that eruption. I, I can maintain no, this. No, the, the pity melts into sukha. Okay. It melts into that satisfied place in the first jhana. In the second jhana, it just keeps erupting and erupting and erupting and erupting. <laughs> But it's also very satisfying, very sukha, very pleasant. Okay. Yeah, as far as from just the words that I read, I always thought first jhana was rapture, second one was ease, third one was uh, happiness, or no, the other way around. Uh, rapture, uh, happiness, tranquility or ease, and then uh, equanimity from just the words. I'm trying okay, to but that's it. an oversimplification. Yeah, probably. That's trying to that's trying to give a one word answer to uh, a, a a question that needs a page or two to talk yeah. about. And so by taking that very, very shorthand version of it and, and working with only that, you're missing much of the richness of the detail that's actually going on to where I would not say that the, what, the way that you're talking, talking about it could not be classified that way. Yeah. Yes, rapture is to be developed in the first jhana. Okay. So the main difference it really, is like really takes over in the second when you're beginning to work with feelings, when the mind is quiet, when there's no thinking about it, there is only the experience of the here now. And it's very, very satisfying, which gives the point about happiness. The third jhana then is when the analogy is, is that imagine that you had a, uh, a lotus flower that was in a brook and the water was rushing down that brook so that so much so that the that the, the flower was bent over in that water because of the rush of it but in time the the lotus plant stem gets really strong so that it can stand upright even in that rush of water it can shake off that water and be free from that water even though the rush is still there. Hmm. This is the third jhana. Okay, and how that is, is that he, never mind that all of these feelings are here, we're going to kind of ignore them completely. That now that we've activated the body and got it really, really rushing strongly, we're going to start to ignore it. And then in the fourth jhana is when uh, the analogy is, imagine that you were covered with a white shimmering sheet so that you're given a, a, a ghost-like appearance where the body is not really there. This is also in English re um, referred to as out-of-the-body experience. And what's really going on is, is that now that we've shut down the verbal part of the mind, we begin also to shut down the emotional part of the mind. And along with that into the poor jhana, we're now actually shutting down the reptilian part of the mind that's associated with the brain stem. So that we're no longer functioning in that. And now what is left in the fourth jhana is that fully functioning first full frontal cortex that we really got alive in our practice. We woke that dude up and he's been managing this whole show the whole time as we systematically shut down these more primitive states of the brain. And now the big dude's in charge. This fourth jhana means that now I can actually feel the connection with the cosmos. This space is not what it what I thought it was that it expands, that things move around. Now, some translators translate this as infinite space, but believe me, the concept and the word infinite did not exist in the time of the Buddha. 
because the whole idea and reason for having the word infinite in finite is that we're going to divide by the number zero. And if our mathematical system doesn't have a zero, there's even no idea about the mathematical concept of infinite. So why the word infinite gets into the English translation, I don't know. What we're talking about is boundaries and whether things are bound less or not, or what is the boundary between the body and the reality of space around us. The answer is, is that they're connected together. There is no boundary there. It's bound less, no boundary. How that gets translated into <laughs> infinite, I don't know. But you can see maybe that in certain situations, boundless means infinite. But in fact, there is nothing in the physical world anywhere, either energy, matter, universe, regardless of the first, forest, galaxy, there is still only a finite number of things there with finite time. There is nothing other than a mathematical concept of infinite that's actually infinite. Nothing. Just large, large numbers. <laughs> so in that regard, those kind of things are not, are not, they are in fact bounded. There are boundaries. Nothing is infinite. There's only so much of it there. So that's not a really good word to use. Boundless we can work with in the sense of what's the boundary between the physical body and the air that we're in? What's the boundary between the butt and the chair that I'm in? Well, it's not a me there. And that's also part of the boundary issue. <laughs> that, the, that the human mind is just a functioning. All right, so that's the idea of boundless space. Boundless consciousness means that when we get, there's another part that we need to talk about first, and that's the quality of neither perception nor non-perception. What that means is, is that the part of the mind that is doing the perceiving has now been shut down to the point that the only thing that we're perceiving is that which can kick off perception the source of the perception. And what is that? Consciousness. Consciousness feeds perception. So when perception is almost not there, that does not, what, what normally happens is the consciousness feeds perception and perception uses Sankara in order to understand and present a mental image or a mental object that then can be seen by the brain. At this level, we are shutting down that Sankara, that process of data from the old past of the reptilian brain, so that now um, perception no longer has, it's almost like having now a laptop that's got no hard drive. Hmm. Like you disconnect the hard drive after you get the operating system booted and the hard drive, you've got no data, you've got nothing to perceive with. So what the perception does is then it turns on to consciousness itself. What is the source? Keep looking at the source and this is when we begin to see that uh, that little bit of perception that's left is what is called neither perception or non-perception because there is enough perception there to perceive consciousness, but there's not enough perception there because it has no data to operate with. I know this is a little bit confusing, but this is the experience and Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa had backed it up. In fact, I was doing these jhana things before I ever met Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa. Just comes with the territory. All right, so now that we can see uh, with, with what perception is there, we can see consciousness moving. Why is it moving? Because we're moving from object to object to object to object to object. That's the way that consciousness always operates. That uh, within the, uh, gosh, there's several suttas. One of them is the Bhaya Sutta in the Udana, where the Buddha talks about it in this regard. Seeing 
is merely the seen. Heard is merely the heard. Cognized is merely the cognized. Now, what does this mean? Seen is merely the seen means we don't have any idea about what it is that we're looking at. We're not taking an object. We're just gazing with the eyes. So that seeing is merely seeing. That's the consciousness. It's not processed into a thought, not even recognized. At this state, when you see a tree, the tree is not known or recognized as a tree. It's barely even recognized as green. Colors are actually quite deep, and so we can understand colors and also just movement. Colors and movement, shapes and that kind of stuff is all there's left. But understanding about what we're looking at is not there. One can take this on as an object intentionally without going through the jhanas. And that is by intentionally with the eyes, for instance, not taking an object. In other words, if you catch yourself looking at something, stop looking at it and look at something else and just let the gaze keep moving around. And if the eyes settle on something, see that the eyes have settled on something and keep moving. Don't take any objects. This would be the way that you can practice in first jhana so that you can get a very clear understanding of what the fourth jhana is. This is why they call them Vipassana jhanas is because with Vipassana and understanding exactly what we're doing, we can recreate these states fairly easily to where got dudes who do it the hard way, it will take them years because they really don't know what they're doing. Sounds like you shift away from the content of what you're looking at towards the process. Yes, exactly. That's why you get very process oriented and you stop getting event oriented. Mm -hmm. Everything becomes just a process, just part of the show. <laughs> Can you function like that in daily life? It's no, <laughs> absolutely not. You can in first genre. But I, I would, <laughs> I remember one guy on a, a group many, many, maybe 20 years ago when he said that he was driving and doing Fort John. I says, hey, man, if I was a cop, I'd pull you over <laughs> driving while under the influence of John. <laughs> DWJ. <laughs> no, you cannot drive a car in Fort John. The mind is not capable of that. You know, you need to have the kind of either ordinary mind out of jhana or first jhana. Then, in fact, um, you, you could go so far as to do second jhana in walking meditation. But I would recommend that you do it bounded. In the sense that you've got a 20 meter or whatever points and you go from here to there and when you get there you stop you review you turn around and then you go back again in a bounded place that it's not a wise idea to walk out into traffic in second job yeah. what is the use of this way of looking at things this not the buddha could not find one these are techniques that were developed and then the buddha studied and he found out that they were not liberating Oh, okay. <laughs> That's kind of nice. Yes, these, uh, especially the second, third, and fourth John are not liberating. They're not useful. There's way too much concentration. It does not get the job done. So the guys who get into these fourth John estates, they want to stay their whole lives in that fourth John estate. And that's why they get attached to being a monk and sitting in a temple and just sitting there day after day, all day long, all night long, as all are doing. That's what Bodhidharma did in the cave for about nine years because he liked it. <laughs> just sitting there. That's what Zazen is all about, just sitting. Nothing to do, no place to go, and just, ah, oh, this is so nice, except that in the Fort Jhana, you can't even say it. <laughs> you cannot even say, oh, so nice. 
<laughs> but you cannot live your life like that and nobody would want to. That the place to be, the sweet spot to live is first job. Because then you're free from suffering. And that's what the Buddha's teaching is all about. We don't need these very, very high states. But Westerners, oh, that's the goal. Oh, I'll feel really good if I can make poor jhana because I'll be better than everybody else on the block. And then we go on to write it. I can do fourth jhana. I can do fourth jhana. You know, this is the whole point of meditation for many people. Is attaining things that they can brag about as opposed to being fully liberated, which is the teaching of the Buddha. So first jhana would already be in your uh, understanding. So the point from where you practice is when you feel like you're successful and staying now and you're not having to deal with uh, laziness and restlessness and this kind of stuff. You're Why? Because you're free from that. Those are all hindrances, especially that restlessness stuff. You want to make sure that any restlessness that comes up is uh, I see you, I see you. You're not going to pull me out of my sukkah. I'm not going to let you take over. I'm feeling like I'm moving more into that right now. And then I'm, uh, yeah, what, what do I do from this place? How, how can Enjoy I it. Just that. So. Enjoy, All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's really hard for Westerners, okay, to understand this statement. The job has been done. What needed to be done has now been done. The work is over. Until you fall out of first jhana, and now all you need to do is work it up and get the right effort to get back into first jhana, and now you don't need to do anything else. This is it. Mm. I guess there there is a sort of clinging, and if I ask for, and what now? I want to keep yeah, it and make sure it stays like that. Right? Yeah, that's what that's that's what you want to do is just maintain that state, keep it that way, by keeping hindrances at bay, hmm. by keeping anxiety at bay. So when anxiety comes in the chest, we can take a deep breath. I saw you. <sighs> Go away, Mr. Anxiety. Yeah, bye-bye. <sighs> Don't need him anymore. <laughs> and just keep coming back and coming back. Um, are the wo worries, are they thoughts, or can this be something more subtle? Feelings are it more can... subtle than thoughts. They are... Thoughts we pay attention to, but our feelings we don't pay attention to until they become really strong in the body. And once the body feels them, they're already quite active. This is why Bhikkhu Buddhadasa recommends to stay right at that point of contact so that when a feeling arises, you know it as a feeling of merely I like it, I don't like it, rather than it growing into a feeling of I really got to have it or I really got to get rid of this. You don't let it go. You catch it really subtly. You notice it. You say, aha, I see you. Never mind. Out you go. Okay. So you keep the feelings at bay. You maintain the state of sukha rather than liking and wanting. There's a complete difference. A lot of people don't understand that sukha that we're talking about here is the satisfaction of having gotten everything you need, which is different than the from the liking that turns into wanting. This is satisfaction with just the liking. And you like how you feel. So this is the right way to practice. Let me finish up this with, with this point. It does not matter so much about what tradition or what, um, let us say, theoretical basis or anything else like that, what teachings, what ideas, those things are not so important as one thing. And that one thing is correct practice. 
So if you can learn how to pr practice correctly from a psychologist, then that's okay. I don't think you can for a couple of reasons. But correct practice is the important thing. So whether you're practicing through Vajrayana or Theravada or Zen or even Christian prayer, if you're doing it right, then you become very, very satisfied with the way things are and you like it and you want to maintain that very satisfied place. And so whatever it takes to get you into that place, well, here's the thing, the Buddha has actually laid it out in great detail. Gives you exactly step-by-step -step instructions. You do this, you do that, you do that. You take these four things, you take a deep breath. You really feel good because you like what you're doing and you feel really successful at it and blah, 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 and off you go. Now you're in first jhana, can you keep it? Can you keep it? Can you keep the uh, hindrances at bay? Can you allow only wholesome thoughts in the mind? What are wholesome thoughts? Thoughts about the Four Noble Truths as they're happening right now. <gasps> oh, this is Third Noble Truth. Yeah, I like, I like that. <laughs> this is the way to practice is by seeing the Four Noble Truths in action while they're operating. When you come to that state of unified mind, know that the mind is unified. When you're in a state of rapture, a state of pity, know that you're in that. When you're in a state of sukha, know that that's what you're doing right now. That's why correct practice requires more than most people. You can't just do it right by accident. You got to do it right because you know you're doing it exactly right. So that's what we mean by correct practice. And correct practice in this regard almost requires an, uh, a natural method as opposed to an organized method. Because an organized method assumes what the steps are going to be in advance. To where in this regard, doing it to natural method, oh, we know what to do next because of the conditions that we find right now. And so the natural method is, is a better approach than the organized method. How does the, the, the ethics component of the Noble Eightfold Path play in there? Because that seems to be more about behavior. Exactly. And at the ordinary level, it does. But at the noble level, it has to do with how noble the mind is. If you are free from greed, then you will not act in a greedy way. If you are free from uh, uh, fear, then you will not act in fearful or angry ways. So that's the noble way to do it. When the mind is noble and unified, you just naturally abstain from those things. If the mind is not, then it then the mind will tend to go to those places. So now you have to have rules or boundaries set up to keep you from making mistakes. In that regard, you could say that the wisdom is weak. When the wisdom is strong, you don't need any rules. And in fact, when the when the when wisdom is strong, you could say that okay, now I know what the rules really are. And the rules really are suffering and no suffering. That's the only rule there are. There really is. Because that's what you really want. That's why you came to meditation. And when you got that, you got it. I'm free from suffering. What else do you want? <laughs> you got your satisfaction already. What is it that you want now? <laughs> <laughs> Enlightenment plus, I think they call it. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the professional model, <laughs> where you can actually make money off of being happy. <laughs> Amazing. I kind of remembered right now of the sutras where at the end of the sutra someone some monk will say oh this dharma is so great and that's kind of how the sutra ends it's a bit how i feel right now like this really yeah just amazing how simple it can be too <laughs> it is it's not a big deal 
the real the real question is can you remember to do it hmm. i've got one urgent question for my practice okay um what what is meant with uh, exp uh, with step three because i wonder if it means like feeling the breath as a body or feeling my whole body and feel the breathing there okay this is how you work with that as you start to practice step one and step two you cannot do step one without actually doing a sum of step three especially if your eyes closed how do you know an in-breath is an in-breath How do you know a long breath is a long breath? The answer is I can feel it. I know. I just here it is. You know, this is absolutely first class direct experience. So you want to can capitalize on that and move from uh, it going deeper and deeper means that as you're breathing, you begin to watch the body as it's breathing more and more closely in the sense of waking it up. As Gawanka talks about it, he talks about it in the sense of experiencing the touch of the cloth. Or if there's any wind, experiencing the wind. Feeling your face, experiencing that. But we do it through and by Anapanasati. Or we do step three with step one and step two. Mm -hmm. And so we scan and we watch and we wake it up. We make it vibrantly alive. That vibrantly alive, by the way, is part of the uh, building of the of the rapture, letting the body become quite alert, quite alive, and we become aware of all of the sensations of the body that we haven't been paying attention to. We've been up here thinking, 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 and not paying attention to what the body was doing. Now we're going to start paying attention to what the body is doing first while it's sitting still, and then later we're going to start paying attention to the body while we're moving around. Mm -hmm. um, in Goenka, it's like uh, you're directing attention to a certain part, or... Yes, but that's an organized method, but there, and there's nothing really wrong with it. Okay. But, the, but the outcome of that is, is that every part that you have visited now has been woken up just a little bit more. So that as you're scanning through the body, each different part is opened up and, and wakened up. And that that's an advantage. So that you can actually experience that part of the body throughout daily life. Because you've actually been paying attention to it. And that actually paying attention to it then is going to, uh, let us say, complete some nerve connections dynamically as you're doing that body scan. You're actually rearranging the way that the nerves experience or uh, register the experience of the body. Um, so you're I, actually building nerve connections by I, doing that scanning. I can feel some tingling or some some like a vibration or something in my whole body is that yeah. something i should cultivate okay yeah that's to be cultivated the, and in fact the the ultimate of the cultivation is that then becomes the artesian well that we mentioned in the second jhana where that that tingling sensation <laughs> becomes almost overwhelming <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's how you would experience the body, is by watching it closely. You can either do it, um, you can do it selectively or you can do it or in the organized way that the Goenka does it. With Mahasa, they do it in the sense of rising, falling, touching, and sitting. Well, the touching is the body all over the body, especially with the rising and the falling that you're already looking at the body. The rise, of course, is the in-breath and the fall is, of course, the out-breath. And then the sitting is understanding the proprioceptic, that you know what that is. You know the position that your body is in without having to look at where your limbs or your arms or your legs are. You already know your posture. How do you know that? Because it's the data is just available as part of the nerve system is called the, by the scientists the proprioceptic nerve system 
body positions, body parts. You can't walk without knowing. You can't even stand up correctly without knowing where your body is. How do you know where your body is? The answer is it's just telling you where it is. Look at that communication system. Look at that sitting. How do I know where the body is? I can feel it. So that's the way to practice that state three of Anapanasati is get familiar with the body. Wake it up. Know what it is to experience the body. Become good friends with it as we started this talk. Mm-hmm. And can I ask a second question? Or don't we have time? Sure. Sure. Um, no. What, what's the difference between step four, bodily fabrication, as it's sometimes translated, and step eight, uh, mental fabrication? Oh, gosh, that's going to take at least a whole nother talk. Okay, so we, we stop at, at that, maybe. Okay, but you do know enough to see the difference between the body itself, when the body is relaxed. Yeah. And then you also know when the mind is, is, uh, is not bubbling with emotion. Yeah. That, in fact, it's almost impossible that if you're really angry and pissed off, it's hard to keep the body still. It's hard to tranquilize the body when the mind is full of crap. Yeah. So therefore, it's not even a good idea to think of, oh, I'm going to practice step four of Anapanasati before I do step eight of Anapanasati. Isn't that possible? <laughs> mm-hmm. No, you got to do step eight first before you do step four in that regard. They're not steps. Yeah. They're aspects. But we keep forgetting because we've already been trained to call them steps. The best we can do is to recognize that it is not army steps. This is not a march. That this is a dance. Sophisticated waltz or something like that. A tango. But in that case, the footsteps are, are not arranged in advance. You, you just take the next step because that's where you are. And in that regard, you can also think about playing a piano or playing music that not all music goes C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Can you imagine every piece of music in the world? And that's the only tone there was, was that you have to have a D followed by an E followed by an F. I mean, you can change the rhythm, but you can't change the note system, sequence, right? What kind of music is that? Oh, no, you want to be able to play all over the place. That's the way to practice Anapanasati. Stop looking at these things as steps and recognize that whatever you need to be doing, that's what you should be the next step. That's why we call it the natural method. So even though we teach Anapanasati in the sequence that is being taught, you don't practice it like that. Practice what you need to do next in this present moment. So at that step nine, when when sati comes, then what do you do next? Now that you've recognized that the mind has wandered away from the breath, what do you do next? You gladden the mind with right effort. Then you come back to the breath, take a long string breath. And when it's done correctly and together, that's also the time when pity arises. Oh, I can do this meditation stuff. I saw that mind wandering away is the kind of stuff that's happening in it. But you don't have the time or the inclination to say those things. That's just the feeling that comes. The feeling of success. Grand success. With that in-breath and that out-breath. This feels good. This is successful. I like this. This is not a of good stuff. <laughs> So that's the way to practice. Take that deep breath. <laughs> so did that answer your question? Yeah. Good. Excellent. Well, let's shut this off now, and I'll go do something else or not. <laughs> Whatever. So we'll see you guys later. I've got, this is the first time I've ever had two Christians at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> See you soon. See you on Reddit or something. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye.